Welcome to the ISG quarterly call summarizing the second quarter of 2018. My name is Howard Coleman and I am the Chief Investment Officer of Coldstream. And with me today is Rafael Villagran, the Portfolio Manager for George Pierce's team here at Coldstream. Today I will be providing a market recap and Rafael will present our special topic, which for this call is on Coldstream's investment process. There is a box on your screen where you can type in any questions you might have. We will try to address all of your questions today, but if we do not get to all of them, please contact your relationship manager or your portfolio manager with your questions. While well, we scheduled this call for 30 minutes, please bear with us if we run over by a bit so that we can cover these topics for you. Thank you, and now for the market recap. For the second quarter of 2018, the U.S. Um, domestic markets did fairly well. There was a significant dichotomy in the second quarter, however, between U.S. markets and foreign markets, especially the emerging markets. As you can see from the chart, in the second quarter, emerging markets were down almost 8%, while all of the U.S. markets, the Russell 2000, the S&P 400, which is mid-caps, the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 were all up. However, even within the U.S. markets, there was significant dispersion among the returns. For example, the Dow was only up 1.25%, while the Russell was up a significant amount at 7.75%. Why did this diversion occur? Primarily, there were two factors. Number one, small caps benefited the most from tax reform that was kicking in. And secondly, trade tensions had an impact on those companies that had significant international exposure, and U.S. small caps being domestically based did not have those. Um, emerging markets suffered from two things. Number one, trade talk, and number two, the strengthening U.S. dollar, because the second quarter saw strong dollar strengthening. In the U.S. REIT market, you can see that was the best performer at the bottom of the page. It was up 10.11%. REIT struggled last year and did not do well comparatively in the first quarter of this year because they are interest rate sensitive. And when interest rates in the long end of the curve, the 10-year end rise, usually that has a negative effect on REITs. Uh, interest rates did not rise this quarter, did not meet expectations where some people were thinking the 10-year would go to 3, 3.5%. Three it did not, and this was a wind in the back in the REITs of REITs. Bonds also had a difficult quarter, uh, with international bonds being down 5.11%, and that, again, uh, had something to do with the dollar because many of these emerging market countries have dollar-denominated bonds, and as the dollar strengthened, it created more of their uh, currency to pay those bonds back. Um, and the Barclays Ag was down 16 uh, basis points as well, um, as the bond market did not perform particularly well this quarter either. Uh, these are charts showing how the different equity classes did. The, the black line is how the, the equity class did. The blue line is the 50-day moving average, and the red line is the 200-day moving average. The red line is an important technical indicator when you drop below that. Um, we can see the U.S. large caps uh, are well above their 200-day moving average. And U.S. SMID, this chart actually looks better. Uh, even though it's declined a little bit recently, we're above our 50-day moving average. The NASDAQ, which uh, was also a significant outperformer, tech outperformed, not quite as much as SMID did, but tech outperformed the rest of the market, um, also has a very good looking chart. This compares to international developed, which you can see broke through significantly the 200 day moving average. And um, the 200 day moving average crossed over the 50 day moving average by a little bit, which is often called a death cross, which is a bearish sign. Uh, emerging markets also uh, have fallen off this quarter, um, but profitability in emerging market corporations, unlike profitability in international developed corporations, by and large, continues to improve. This has a lot to do with the geopolitical factors that happened over the last quarter. So 
Let's talk about domestic versus international and some of the reasons domestic has done so well compared to international over the last quarter. First is GDP. Um, U.S. GDP year over year at the end of the first quarter was up 2.8%. The predictions right now for second quarter GDP year over year are a very strong 4%, and the predictions for the year as a whole are around 3%. This is stronger than what's been the kind of 2% growth that we've seen periodically. It's very much due to tax reform um, and the stimulation, the, the stimulus in the economy that's provided. Uh, so it may be temporary to some extent. We may fall back to 2% over time. But for this year, uh, we're looking at stronger GDP growth and the market is reflecting that. Um, we have low unemployment and participation is ticking up. The, we had a brief uptick in the last uh, unemployment number, but that actually wasn't a negative because it was coupled with uh, more people coming into the workforce. So our employment situation is very strong. Uh, consumer confidence has fallen off a little bit as the markets have been jittery, but it's still uh, well above uh, historical averages and it's strong consumer confidence. This is uh, earnings um, and there's increased earnings per share expectations, but we've also seen significant increase in earnings in the first quarter. And this chart shows that in the first quarter of 2018, corporate earnings were up 27% year over year. Now, what that's great. Uh, what else is very interesting is that um, greenish part of the bar chart at the right, where it says first quarter 2018, that's revenue. That's top line growth. That's really what we're looking for. If you go back and, for example, look at 2010, where we had enormous 47% profit, most of that was margin. And margin is really comes uh, from cost cutting, not revenue growth. And we, you want to see revenue growth as you want to see corporations expanding. And this is a very healthy 27%, again, uh, aided to significantly by tax reform. Now, this is globe warnings, and we can see U.S. corporate earnings are far higher than European corporate earnings and EM co corporate earnings. Um, this is a little bit impacted, maybe more than a little bit. It is impacted by the fact that this is in the dollar, and the dollar rallied strongly. But nonetheless, uh, U.S. global uh, corporations are significantly outperforming European, which gives you um, a strong indication of why U.S. markets outperformed Europe. In addition, consensus GDP forecasts, as I mentioned, for the U.S., the estimate's about 3%. For Europe's about 1.6%, and that's actually a declining GDP from 2017. So these are factors that have gone into the fact that there's been a divergence between the U.S. and the European markets. Now, we have these strong fundamentals in the U.S., but what's been holding back the stock market to some extent is a wall of worry. And the wall of worry is really about two things. It's first about the Federal Reserve Board, and they are tightening interest rates and reducing their balance sheets. The second is the potential trade war, and I'm going to touch on both of these briefly. Um, QE, uh, which was implemented, as we all know, after the financial crisis where the Fed both lowered interest rates and actually went into the marketplace and bought bonds, has ended. Um, for a good period of time, it ended, but the Federal Reserve was buying new bonds as old bonds rolled off as they matured. Now they're not, and we are seeing the Fed balance sheet um, tighten as the Fed owns less and less assets, still by historical standards quite a bit, but less and less. And this is tightening, and this is um, this limits growth to some extent. This creates higher interest rates as there's less demand to purchase paper, and um, has the potential of putting a, a governor on economic growth. The other thing we've seen significantly is yield curve flattening. And the yield curve really is the rate you get for a treasury bond beginning at three months out to 30 years. And you can see the, the grayish black line is 2013. We had a very steep yield curve. Um, you got 10 basis points for a one-year bond and you got 4% for a 30-year bond. Right now, the yield curve is very flat. Um, from 
five years you're getting 2.7 percent and 30 years you get three percent that's 30 basis points to hold a bond for 15 more years 20 basis points to hold the bond for 10 more years for excuse me eight more years and uh, a flat yield curve is oftentimes an indicate not a flat yield curve but if the yield curve inverts in other words if the 10-year bond has a lower interest rate than the two-year bond this is a reliable recession indicator um, and we can see from this chart the gray area is when we're in recession and uh, when it go goes below zero percent that's the um, an inverted yield curve between the twos and the tens and right about six months after we invert in the yield curve we go into a recession and this goes back this chart goes back to 1980 but recessions to the mid 50s have for the large part been preceded by an inversion of the yield curve this is something the Fed is very concerned about as they continue to raise rates in the short end um, they do not want to invert the yield curve and this is a challenge for the Fed. Um, the other challenge for the Fed is inflation. Inflation has reached the Fed targets. And in the box there that has the numbers, the bottom one, core PCE deflator, 2% has been the Fed's target. Um, it's still below the 50-year average of 3.4%, but they are at target right now. Um, so they're in a little bit of a conundrum. Um, they if they don't raise rates, they are concerned about inflation picking up, and that's one of their mandates to keep inflation under control. If they do raise rates, they run the risk of inverting the yield curve and creating a recession. So it's, it's really a delicate balancing act for the Fed right now. Um, this is wage inflation, um, which is a big component of inflation. It's been relatively contained, but it has ticked up recently, as you can see, and that is one of the risks that if the Feds do not raise, um, that we will um, continue to have low interest rates, significant expansion, and perhaps um, inflation and in wages. Um, now let's talk about tariffs for a minute. So, so that is a, let me just back up and summarize before we go to tariffs. Um, that's the conundrum the Fed is in. That's something the markets are concerned about, the yield curve being extremely flat, uh, inflation beginning to reach Fed targets, and um, that presents some one of the elements of the wall of worry in the market. The second, and probably the one that's causing the most volatility in the markets, is, is trade. And I think we all know this, but this chart demonstrates why President Trump is concerned about trade. This is the current account balance, which, generally speaking, is exports versus imports. There's some nuances to that, but that's for our purposes, that's close enough. And we can see that the U.S. is in a significant current account balance deficit. Uh, we're running a current account balance of below $500 billion. This is what uh, President Trump wants to bring up to, to actually zero, which will be a very tough task, but that's, uh, that's his goal. Um, in doing so, and this is a noisy chart, uh, this is a chart that's rumored to be considered by the Fed uh, but it's actually a very interesting chart. And I'm going to take a minute and walk you through it. Um, this is for very different types of products and services, what's happened to prices since 1997. And you'll notice that uh, what's increased the most in the dark blue, hospital services, in the white, college textbooks, in the purple, uh, college tuition, for example. What has decreased significantly for example, is televisions, is apparel, is food and, and beverages, medical care has increased. And what are the differences? Those things that have decreased are goods subject to foreign competition. Those that have increased are services not subject to foreign competition. So I've raised this because there's the potential of tariffs. And what we've seen when there isn't foreign competition is that prices rise. So this is one of the risks that we've got from a tariff situation. And actually, we have seen it. The first two tariffs that have been imposed have been on washing machines and timber. And we've seen significant increases in both washing machine and timber prices. This is why those who are opposed to tariffs 
call it a tax on the consumer. Uh, those who are in favor of tariffs say, yes, there is some initial pain, but we need to straighten out the current account deficits and have fair trade practices, so we may have to swallow that pain. Um, this is a chart of another potential impact of tariffs, and this has to do with China retaliatory tariffs on soybeans. Um, they haven't been implemented as of yet, but we see what's happened to soybean futures in the left-hand column, the left-hand chart, they have collapsed. We also seen when um, President Trump makes pronouncements about trade, what happens to the market. And you can see pretty much with every pronouncement, uh, the market sells off at least temporarily. So trade is, is a significant component of the wall of worry and it creates marketplace volatility. However, and this is an important however, when you compare the impact of tariffs to the stimulus caused by physical, pol physical policy in, in the form of tax cuts, spending and repatriation, uh, the amount of tariffs is dwarfed by the um, wind at the back created by physical policy. Now this doesn't mean it's not a tax on the consumer and ha have some inflationary uh, implications, nor does it mean that for certain segments of the economy, it will have very negative implications. But in terms of the total amount at issue, um, fiscal policy far outweighs tariffs. And finally, we like to end with the leading economic indicators because as you, again, the gray line is recession. The, um, the blue line is the leading economic indicators. And when those roll over uh, in about six months after that, you typically get a recession. Uh, the leading economic indicators are still strong and uh, we do not see a recession in sight. So that concludes my market update. I'd like to now turn it over to Rafael. Uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, thanks for that detailed update on the current market environment. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to elevate the conversation and uh, share about Coldstream's investment process from a 30,000 foot view. I want to first say that since its founding, Coldstream has been hi highly focused on a proprietary investment discipline. And as the industry has evolved over time, so has uh, Coldstream's approach, including its tools and decision making uh, disciplines. Within my overview today, I will uh, highlight some of the enhancements that we've implemented over the last year or two as well. So um, let's start by saying that our investment process starts by getting to know our clients. This is actually an ongoing process which continues over a course of a client's life and takes into consideration all the changes that life can bring. Uh, we seek to gain an in-depth understanding of uh, our client's needs, goals, and even dreams. A critical part of that process relates to jointly defining a client's risk tolerance. How your portfolio is allocated and its holdings depend directly on how much risk you're willing to take. As you can imagine, it would be a very different answer if we ask a client, how much money do you want to make by investing as opposed to asking a client, uh, how much risk are you willing and able to take? Um, we, uh, we do the latter. We can uh, then build a custom portfolio that's positioned to address a client's personal situation. The remainder of my presentation will unpack the processes which support our deliverables on the right side of the slide, and those relate to investment and portfolio construction. Overall, our investment process is based on modern portfolio theory and the interrelationship of investment risk and return as conveyed by the efficient frontier. While markets can be unpredictable in the near term, they have been quite consistent over the longer term and through market cycles in terms of the relationship of risk and return. In order to pursue greater return potential, an investor must be willing and importantly able to accept greater potential risk. The efficient frontier as shown on this slide reflects the longer term risk return relationship based on portfolio blends of the traditional asset classes of stocks and bonds. This chart is not merely an artist rendering, it's actually based on 20 years, 28 years of data for US stocks and US investment grade bonds, so that's 1989 to 2016. And this relationship is consistent whether we measure risk as volatility of returns or standard deviation, or whether we consider downside risk or drawdown which is a measure of declines from market peaks to troughs. 
we show five standard portfolio blends on this chart, but the relationship is basically a continuum. Stocks have consistently provided the greatest return over time, although stocks can also represent the most volatile asset class. And also stocks can exhibit sizable peak to trough corrections in the neighborhood of 50%, such as occurred as recently as 2002 and 2008. Owning just stocks present risks which are not suitable for most clients. It is for this reason that our portfolios typically incorporate diversification with asset classes that are uncorrelated to stocks. These are investments that zig when stocks zag and also investments that don't go down as much in an equity market correction. Such diversification vehicles can include bonds and alternative investments and, and we use those. Uh, this uh, next slide uh, presents a simplified overview of our portfolio construction process. So let's unpack it from left to right. Our opportunity set are the global markets and includes all asset classes. We do generally apply a home country bias. We, we also seek opportunities for diversification and return enhancement from all over the globe. Before we select specific investments, we are very intentional about, about our asset allocation. We are careful about allocation weights to stocks, bonds, and alternatives. And we are generally intentional about allocations within stocks as well. For example, domestic versus international, large caps versus mid caps, also even international developed and international emerging markets. And from Howard's presentation, uh, you can see that uh, overweighting uh, outperforming uh, segments and underweighting underperforming segments can be very important as uh, reflected from the recent dispersion between US and international stocks. To implement our asset allocation, we then seek uh, the best of breed asset managers and funds from an open architecture. Uh, that means that we are not confined to just one or even a few fund management companies, but rather we search the universe of all available managers and funds to find what's best for our clients. More on the selection process a bit later, but first I want to unpack um, the asset allocation disciplines. So the overview is we have uh, three segments in our allocation approach, strategic, regime, and tactical considerations. For strategic allocations, we base these uh, on multi-decade considerations of risk, return, and correlations between the asset classes. When we determine our strategic allocations, we want to be, remain very respectful of the efficient frontier, and we seek to make allocation decisions that can favorably influence risk-adjusted returns through market cycles. Basically, that means core long-lasting allocations intended to achieve either better returns or less risk as compared to the benchmark continuum that would be available from just standardized stock bond plans. Uh, then, uh, then comes the regime allocation. Coldstream has utilized strategic and tactical allocation disciplines for some time. If you've been a client for a while, you've probably heard us talking about those allocations. It's been over more recent quarters that we have fine-tuned and implemented a regime allocation approach. Uh, regime allocations are based on multi-year observations of economic and market trends. Uh, we will review this discipline in the next slide, uh, since it's uh, something we just added. Uh, then, uh, then comes tactical allocations. These are based on multi-quarter multi indicators, particularly momentum and valuation. Um, and recently, we've also considered policy. Implications around tax cuts and trade tariffs have been things that we've uh, made decisions around. Tactical allocation decisions are intended to last for shorter periods of time and can be motivated as much by risk mitigation as well as by perceived opportunities for return. So now let's uh, discuss a regime al allocation discipline a little bit further. So asset classes behave differently at each phase of an economic cycle. And we believe that um, interest rates, inflation, and valuations are key drivers to what can be multi-year return cycles. We, are, we also observe that asset correlations can vary with economic conditions and risk tolerances. You can envision a risk on market or a risk off market when it comes to that. Uh, for these reasons, uh, we believe it's very important to understand the current economic environment. Notably, our assessments of the global economies are not based on opinions of others or forecasts, but rather on objective data. We'd rather be a little late in confirming an economic trend with better probabilities of being correct, rather than try to be early and risk being wrong. Uh, in a confirmed recovery, uh, direct your attention to the uh, circle on the right, in a confirmed recovery expansion phase of the economic cycle, stocks work very well, as can high yield bonds and real estate. On the other hand, in a deceleration or recessionary time, stocks are vulnerable. 
Uh, and it can be prudent to emphasize safer investments such as investment grade bonds, even treasuries, and also alternatives that are expected to perform with little or no correlation to stocks. So armed with our, our targets for asset allocations, we then apply our manager selection disciplines to search for the best investments. Uh, we utilize active and passive strategies and funds while considering both the comparative costs and the visibility for our performance that the active manager uh, may offer. By our performance, oftentimes we focus on less downside risk, not just upside. Uh, we utilize uh, also uh, primarily external strategies, but we also offer select internally managed strategies where we believe we have core competencies. Our manager selection disciplines incorporate a couple dozen factors, both quantitative and qualitative. Some quantitative examples are shown on the right side of the slide. Uh, you'll see that we look at multi-year rolling returns. Um, as you can see, we're gathering a lot of data here. We look at returns relative to the peers that also manage in the same space. We focus, as I said earlier, on downside capture many times. We also do stress tests of these managers. Um, examples of stress tests that we are running recently would be like the 2008 financial crisis, the Greek financial crisis, the taper tantrum of 2013. Uh, so we gather a lot of financial data, um, but we also look at qualitative data. We ass assess the fund management team and its tenure the firm, um, as well as the fund's liquidity and other considerations. It takes a village uh, to implement uh, and maintain Coldstream's uh, investment process. And actually more than a village, a team of highly experienced, seasoned, and passionate investment professionals. Uh, this team is what comprises the Coldstream Investment Strategy Group, or ISG, as we refer to it. It's now 13 members strong with over 236 years of combined experience. Coldstream's ISG meets collectively on a monthly basis and also operates out of three committees that focus on discrete, the discrete areas of asset allocation, manager selection, and private investments. I didn't touch on private investments uh, in this presentation, but I will say that um, the due diligence that's applied by that team is very robust, including site visits, meeting with managers, as well as financial analysis. With private investments, we seek uh, unique opportunities that are suitable for our accredited or qualified clients, particularly in the areas that are expected to be uncorrelated with stocks and bonds. Examples uh, that uh, among private investments that our clients have participated in are real estate lending, as well as private real estate, also solar power, a blueberry farm, and, and most recently, a distressed municipal debt fund. Um, that um, completes my overview of our investment process. As you review your portfolios, you'll see the funds and investments that have been selected for you. And if you'd like a better understanding of how the asset allocation applies to, the, to your personal situation, we suggest you contact your, uh, your portfolio manager. So with that, I thank you. And um, do we have time for questions? Yeah, I don't think we have any questions today. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'll talk to you next quarter. And in the meantime, of course, please contact your portfolio manager or relationship manager with any other questions you might have. Thank you.